Okay, salam alaikum. What's the importance of the elbow joint? بصراحة ال elbow joint is not compensatable. تمام. It's not of the elbow joint. It approximates and distance things from the body. يعني عايز أقرب حاجة ليا لازم I have to have an elbow flexion. عايز أبعد الحاجة عني لازم عندي elbow extension. Okay. ما ما احترمنا كامل لل للشولدر شولدر بوزيشنر والريست شن سوبايناشن كنترول الطريقه اللي الريست والهاند بيكمز ابلايد تو ان اوبجكت اوكي اي ثينك اي هاف تو تشينج مايكس بيكوز فانكشنينج فيري ويل كده احسن تالية. طيب يعني ايه الكلام ده؟ يعني the most disability comes from يعني if you see the dash score of a patient the disability from a stiff elbow is more than his disability from a stiff wrist definitely and um, relatively um, to a, a stiff shoulder more important. So placement of the hand and approximation and furthering things from the body. And it's also important to remember that in patients using crutches, canes, walkers, or something, they have to be using uh, their, limb, their upper limbs as weight-bearing joints. This is quite important as well. The range of motion usually in mid degree when zero degrees extension to 150 degrees of flexion, but the function range of motion is from 30 degrees of extension, tines to 90, tines to 120, but this anything between that is acceptable. While pronation and supination is almost 170 degrees from pull supination to full pronation, and the middle half of that which is 45 degrees to either side is considered the functional degree of pronation supination um, the elbow is, ja is actually a combination of three types of joints ulnohumeral which is a third class lever uh, responsible for flexion and extension the proximal radial ulnar joint which is um, a pivot joint that allows rotation, and the radiohumeral joint, which also allows rotation. The anatomy of distal humerus is based on three pillars. Um, this is distal humerus, but you've got your lateral column, which is the lateral supracondylar ridge going down to the capitulum there, and your medial column, which is your medial supracondylar ridge going down to the medial epicondyle. Between those, there is a tie arch. Tie arch means camera um, ma'alla'a. A tie arch is where your trochlea and most of your capitulum stands. Between them, there are two very narrow fossae. From the back, it's called the olecranian fossa because it accommodates for the olecranian. While in the front, it's called the radial, the, the coronoid and the radial fossa because it accommodates for the coronoid fossas and for the radial head. What about the carrying angle? The carrying angle is um, between 4 and 11 degrees. It is the angle between the forearm and the, the arm in full extension. It is due to the, that the medial part of the trochlea is a bit lower in, the, in its distal aspect than the medial part. And it is responsible for carrying the, the arm away from the body. OK? And it's known that the, cube, the carrying angle is more in females because they tend to have wider hips than males. OK? Because of the wider hips, they have a higher, larger carrying angle so that when they carry stuff, they don't have to, it hits, does not hit their bodies. Um, the forward flexion angle is actually very crucial. And for those of you who do surgeries, this is one of the things you have to restore. 
and I'd like to explain to you about it. The, the center of rotation of the humerus is actually displaced anterior to the shaft and in an angle of 40 degrees to the shaft. And what's, why is that important? This is important because um, flexion. During flexion, there's anterior translation of the trochlea allows this anterior translation allows the flexion range to be more anterior than posterior. If it was if it was in the middle, we would probably have a hyperextension of 40 or 90 degrees and a flexion of 40 or 40 degrees, but you couldn't achieve flexion beyond 90 degrees. This elbow joint here will not be able to flex more than 90 degrees. So the anterior translation and the 45 degrees angulation allows for this forward flexion. Also, for flexion extension is facilitated by the coronoid and the radial fossae, as we said, and the olecranian fossae, which is the, the thinnest part of the humerus just above the trochlea and the, cap and the capitellum. What about the stability of the elbow joint? The stability of the elbow joint is actually the most important and the most developed concepts have happened over the last 10 years about the stability of the elbow. Stability as any joint depends on bony congruity, on ligamentous stability, and on opposing tension of muscles. Um, there's the ring theory of stability, and I'll be going that when I discuss pathology. But the ring theory of stability that the elbow is stabilized by a continuous ring. In front, there is the coronoid process, the bicalis, the anterior aspect of the capsule. Behind, there's the posterior column, uh, the, 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 the holocranian process, the triceps, and the posterior aspect of the capsule. Medially, there's the medial collateral ligament, the coronoid process sharing in that too, and the medial epicondyle with its attached ligaments. On the lateral column, there is the radial head, the capitulum, the lateral collateral ligament complex. Um, while bony stability adds little stability to the elbow, it's still the groove in the trochlea uh, is con uh, coincides um, remarkably well and it digitates with a uh, ridge in the middle of the olecranon, the coronoid processes, and the base of the olecranon fossa of the uh, trochlear fossa of the ulna. So this ridge there fits well into this groove. The recranian articulates posteriorly and the coronoid articulates anteriorly. It's quite important for you to appreciate that this anterior lip of the coronoid is extremely important to anteroposterior stability. For a posterior dislocation to happen, we have to lose part of our coronoid or at least our anterior capsule attached to that. However, the medial side of the coronoid process, the medial side, this is radial, this is medial. This is called the antromedial facet of the coronoid. This, the importance of this facet is becoming more and more elaborate as we discuss and restoration and fixation of this in elbow instability is crucial. I'll explain why in the coming slide. So you have to focus with not only the anterior coronoid, but the anteromedial coronoid facet. Elbow flexors are the biceps and the brachialis. The brachialis is actually the main elbow flexor while the biceps is not that important, is, is, is less important as an elbow flexor because it is a multi-joint muscle, moves across the elbow the, and the shoulder as well. And in addition to that, it fixes to the radius to achieve pronation, to achieve supination, super active supination. So it is stronger with the arm in maximum supination as a flexor. However, we all forget the very important dynamic stabilizer to the elbow, which is, 
which is this. This is called the laceratus fibrosis of the biceps. This attaches from the edge of your uh, biceps tendon to the ulnar border of the ulna over the ulnar aspect of the forearm. This, with the anconius, is a dynamic stabilizer to vulgus stress. This is very important. While elbow extension is achieved by the triceps and the, the anconius, the anconius is this very small muscle which is also a dynamic stabilizer to vulgus stress. And as we will learn that most stresses applied to the elbow come in a vulgus direction, from out, from in, from in to out. So dynamic stability against vulgus is very important. I, I usually hammer like that, but I never hammer out. I'm much weaker to that. The proximal radial ulnar joint is a pivotal joint with an annual ligament around the radial head and an interosseous membrane, while the lateral collateral ligament of the elbow is of crucial importance in being integrated with the annular ligament and what is known as the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, which is very important to postlateral uh, humeral instability, postlateral rotary instability. It attaches from the epicondyle directly to the ulna and these are dissections of it. You have to imagine that this is the radial head removed from your anatomical specimen. And to this, this is a reconstruction of it, and this is important to, for you to imagine where that is attached, okay? And this is reattached here, as you can see, to the edge of the ulna and to the medial lateral epicondyle. That's the lateral ulnar collateral ligament. While the medial collateral ligament is very important, again, because it, is, it does resist ulnar uh, vulgus stresses, its anterior bundle, is the anterior oblique bundle is the most important, posterior oblique is less important, anterior oblique becomes more important in flexion. This is how it looks from the side, but this is how it looks from anteroposterior view, and this is how it looks in MRI. That's your anterior oblique bundle of your uh, ulnar collateral ligament, and that's your radial collateral ligament, if you want to see it. Okay, so post anteromedial corner of the coronoid is where it attaches the anteromedial border, and that's why it's very important to reconstitute that during fixation when it's a Valsden fracture. Look at that x-ray when you're thinking. That's post lateral rotatory instability, okay? So back to the ring theory. For anything to happen, those, the ring has to be damaged at least in three parts of that ring for dislocation to happen. And you have to consider the three parts where are reconstituting that. You can have a fracture coronoid anteriorly, you can have a medial uh, coronoid process fracture, anteromedial facet, you can have a posterior allocranian fracture, you can have a radial column fracture, a radial head or a capitulum. And this can be a pure dislocation, a pure dislocation where you've got soft tissue injuries only, or you can have a fracture. What's fractured here? Let's see. You've got your radial head fractured, you've got your coronary process fractured, and you've got a lateral, postlateral dislocation of your elbow. That's what's known as a terrible triad. A terrible triad in which you've got an anterior column fracture, a posterior column uh, uh, fracture, uh, no, sorry, your column fracture and radial head and the lateral collateral ligament avulsion, lateral column injury, plus or minus a medial collateral ligament injury while your posterior column remains intact. So that's your terrible triad, lateral complex, radial head, and a small coronoid, anteromedial facet, and the ruptured medial collateral ligament. So you have to consider the ring theory when you're considering an elbow dislocation, and consider that stability is act dynamic and static, Kinematics of the elbow, kinetics of the elbow are less well recognized, being uh, that there is the leaf, the fulcrum is here, okay, where the biceps holds, and the, the, the muscle ba balance is a longer lever arm anteriorly, which makes the stresses up to three times body weight when you're carrying something. 
Um, regarding fixation, there are, there are three distal humeral fixations. There are a lot of controversies. One or two plates, definitely two plates are better than one. Perpendicular parallel plates, doesn't matter when you're fixing the supracondylar fracture. Elbow replacements, linked or unlinked, depends on how much stability of your soft tissue you've got. An elbow fusion, if you're going to do it unilaterally, you're going 90 degrees, but if you're going bilaterally, one has to be more flexed to be able to approximate the mouth 65 degrees and the other 110. My take home message to you is that the elbow is quite important. The functional range of motion should be well considered. Think about the lateral collateral, lateral ulnar collateral ligament when thinking of instability and your coronoid process as well. Thank you. Shukran, Dr. Ashraf.